Yeah, we'll get started with the RDA meeting uh, for Tuesday, January 19th, 2021. Okay. You want to put the... There we go. As board chair for the redevelopment agency of Murray, I've determined that due to the continued rise in COVID-19 case counts, holding an in-person meeting with the anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those in attendance. Under these circumstances, Utah Code, State Code 52-4-2074 allows for electronic meetings to be held without an anchor location as long as the public has an opportunity to view the meeting and submit public comment. We are holding today's RDA meeting via video conference and the meeting is being live streamed at www.murraycitylive.com. To the RDA, please do so via the email at rda lowercase at murray.utah.gov. Thanks, Melinda. Okay, we'll start the meeting with the approval of the December 8, 2020 RDA meeting minutes and the approval of January 5th RDA 2021 minutes. Do I have any additions, deletions, corrections? Dale, do you want to take them together? Is that okay? Yeah, why don't we if take there them together? There's no uh, If there changes. are no changes. Okay, then I'll make a motion to approve the RDA minutes for December 8th, 2020 and January 5th, 2021. I will I'll second. second. Sorry. Okay, we have, a, we have a motion and a second. Brooke? No, Brooke. All in favor say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? All right, the motion passes. Next, we'll move to citizen comments. Do we have any citizen comments, Melinda? We do. Jay's going to read the couple of comments that we received. Okay, thank you. This first one is from Kate Sturgeon. It says, Dear Mayor Camp, City Council, Redevelopment Agency, Mr. Hall, Ms. Lopez, Ms. Greenwood, and others mentioned within but I was unable to find an email address for whomever makes traffic decisions for the city. This is a long list with multiple areas of concern, but these are the things on my neighbors and my minds regarding the city's move forward with recent planning options and decisions. My true angst is seeing what former mayor Dan Snar's vision for Murray becoming just like every other city between Salt Lake and Provo coming to fruition. Our taxes, utility rates, crime rates are all, are all rising. Services are not keeping pace with increased demand, and now mixed-use zoning is being considered in places where it shouldn't. Jared Hall of the Zoning Department got down to basics for mixed-use. Money, or as he said, better reward with mixed-use than with individual homes or small businesses. The charm of what used to be Murray is rapidly disappearing with new replacement projects. Murray has the advantage of being in the heart of the valley with some of the last large parcels of redevelopable land. No one is making any more land. As the real estate axiom goes, it's location, location, location. Gone or should be gone are the days of the Murray's inferiority complex of accepting any old proposal from the first taker. When I moved here in 1990, a mayoral candidate was dancing ecstatic that the last parcel in Murray has been sold because back then Murray wasn't the place to be and you couldn't give it away. Fast forward 30 years and you, as you, as city leaders, managers, and the ones who shape this, the future of our city, have the unique opportunity to make this redevelopment into something to be proud of and not just another identical cookie cutter suburb with uninspired cloned architecture. Where is a welcoming entrance to Murray? Certainly not State Street, not Vine Street, which after the recent redo from 900 East to 1300 East, is just a heat absorbing, then reflecting treeless multi-lane mess. Heading in from the industrialized west, not there either. 
Nine hundred east isn't particularly pretty until one reaches fifty nine hundred south in Winchester. The very mixed area use that is being considered where new businesses and Wheeler Farm are. Winchester itself is a five lane speedway with its own set of issues. Trees are the cheapest and easiest way to improve aesthetics as well as help cool a city. It seems the design trend of late is to butt projects up to the sidewalk, therefore increasing heat absorbing surfaces with no return benefit, i.e. harnessing all that solar power for positive return and thus negating any possibility for a shady spot. Examples, the corner of Vine Street and State with hotels, mixed use zoning, the new project at Winchester and 520 East, the proposed new mixed use building, residents exiting the subdivision behind the new construction at 520 East Winchester have obscured vision of oncoming traffic as a result of seven foot walls abutting the sidewalk. Whoever approved the sight lines needs to review reality and not wishful thinking. It may meet established guidelines, but no one goes the speed limit or under on Winchester. Murray Police Department could make bank issuing speeding citations there. I ask for better coordination between the planning department and traffic study group to go on site to witness reality and not go by what a book says should work. And in searching Murray's website for emails, I was surprised to learn Murray has a shade tree and beautification commission. Why are they not involved in planning decisions? They seem rather neutered at present. One would think the tree lesson was learned when Fast in Place Mall took out all its mature trees to Xeriscape. Previously, the walk around there was almost pleasant, but no longer. One must use their car to access the shopping center across the street or move anywhere in that area. Local residents are also ripping out their mature trees. I think we will learn a sad lesson as the summers heat up more and more and there's less and less respite from the relentless sun. Walkability. And Murray overall has suffered as well, but specifically pre-COVID, children in the James Point apartments across Winchester, a five lane freeway, to get to their elementary school. Not all children head to the 725E stoplight. Just as cars don't always adhere to the speed limits, children don't always take the approved route. The UDOT's blinking light straddling 900 East at Wheeler Farms is just as dangerous because the pedestrian can't see when the lights are flashing, thereby safe to cross. A simple walk light coordinated with the flashing lights would mitigate that. Longview Elementary children use that space to cross 900 East for their Wheeler Farm field trips. Putting mixed use zoning at the corner of 900 East in Winchester doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit with the current aesthetic of Murray and the established residential neighborhoods surrounding this plat. The corner of 900 East in Winchester is not Fort Union yet. Please don't turn it into that. Logic would say that it makes far more sense to continue in the vein of the offices which lie 900 east from 59 south to Winchester on the west side. They're attractive and should be producing tax revenue for the city. It also keeps in line the quasi-residential look that up to 360 units mix zoning can't. Correct the error which was made 50 years ago when R.C. Willie was permitted to locate its building there. One error needn't be replaced by another. Mixed use makes far more sense in the sea of asphalt between 5900 South and 6100 South in State Street, which is the Shopco pad, the old Toys R Us pad, or Van Winkle and 5600 South. It makes far more sense to happen in those locales where restaurants and ground floor businesses would be welcome. Green space could replace heat absorbing asphalt. Murray has lots of those kinds of eyesores which would make far more sense to change zoning to mixed use than sticking one in an established residential area. In looking at the plans for the 4800 South State Street development and reading the proposed submitted, the proposal submitted by the architectural firm, it states that the minimum parking requirements have been met. So before the cement has cured, there will already be overflow parking issues. This project uses today's standards and since the building will have a shelf life of 30 to 50 years, parking will be grossly inadequate for decades to come. We are currently dealing with the effects of poor parking planning with the lawyer building at the corner of 
725 East Winchester. Cars from that complex spill out onto 725 East and are not contained within the business's lot. That building complex is only a few years old and we already have serious issues there. And that they threatened to sue the city when asked to do something indicates a serious error was made. Can we please learn from it? Murray's website is chronically out of date. There's nothing of substance on Murray's website. RE Fashion Place West Small Area Plan. If one wants to become educated on the happenings in Murray's government, isn't its website the first stop for citizens to educate themselves regarding projects being considered, informing a wider area than only those within a 300 or 500 adjacent perimeter of actions under city consideration would be incredibly helpful as well. The current 300 to 500 foot notice limits Murray citizen engagement regarding the future of the city. Thank you for letting me air some issues with it, which have been building, no pun intended, of late. Granted, COVID hasn't, COVID hasn't helped. When discussing some of the above with a neighbor, he asked, where are they meeting so I can go? Not having a clue that meetings have been held online for months, but also not helping is Murray City making these decades long impacting decisions without the input of its citizens, simply they were under consideration. Good communication is essential in every walk of life and none more so than local government with its citizens. Sincerely yours, Kate Surgeon, 569 East, 6295 South, Murray, Utah, 84107, 30 year resident. Okay, thank you. Do we have uh, more? I granted uh, a longer one for that one because I, I felt it was important that she be able to uh, to uh, express her feelings. Do we have any more? Uh, we do, just a minute. The next two will be uh, in person with uh, participants in the webinar. So give us just a minute and we'll I'll give the two speakers the ability to speak. It is not letting me elevate them to participant. Okay, I think I can do it, Jay. Hold on. I'm not host anymore. Okay, I think I can do it. Hang on. So, Alex, I'm going to start with you, and you should be able to unmute yourself now. Perfect. You can hear me? Yes. Jay made it a point to remind me of the three minute time restriction. I took that as a challenge. So uh, let me get into it. Uh, my name is Alexander Teamsman. I live at 10 West Miller Street, Murray, Utah, District 1. Hello, Redevelopment Agency. Hope you all are doing well. Thank you for the work you're doing. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just want to share a few thoughts regarding the proposed Girding Edland development in the Murray City Center District. I tried to do a little research on Girding Edlin. Their website is not working for me right now. However, I was able to look into their brewery blocks development in Portland. Apologies if I'm sharing information you already know. So Girding Edlin did an absolutely awesome job with the first regiment armory annex, which is now Portland Center Stage at the Armory. Wikipedia says that the armory has become a significant case study for historic preservation and sustainable design. I have confidence that Girding Edlin can do the same in Murray City, striking a balance between innovative, sustainable development while highlight, <coughs> excuse me, highlighting the beauty of nearby historically significant properties. That being said, the concern I would like to share is how the proposed development in the MCCD aside from aesthetics, will affect the character of the downtown and, and Murray as a whole. As I understand it, Girding Edlin will decide what businesses will occupy the retail and dining fronts. 
The Brewery Blocks website shows that there are 27 retail and dining spaces shared between the five blocks. And of the 27 retail and dining spaces at the Brewery Blocks, two are unoccupied and 20 are national brands, such as the North Face, Lululemon, Starbucks, Serve La Table. The remaining five, per my count, include the theater, uh, a framing store with seven locations uh, limited to the Pacific Northwest, known as Frame Central, two restaurants, and Rochelle M, which is a fashion specialty store with three locations throughout Oregon. So more than 80% of the retail fronts are leased to large businesses with no specific ties to Portland or even Oregon. While the selection of stores may have been influenced by the fact that Portland is a larger city, larger than Murray City anyway, it would seem Girding Edlin could do more to prioritize leasing to locally owned restaurants and stores. Or maybe smaller businesses wouldn't be able to afford the leases. Regardless, the selection process of lease of uh, leases for the future development in downtown Murray is something that ought to be reevaluated. The types of businesses that fill those spaces will have long lasting implications for the character of downtown Murray. I look at downtown Provo as an inspiration for the things Murray could do. And of the 133 retail and dining options listed on their website, I could count on one hand the number of national brands. Murray has plenty of big box store and national brand and chain representation throughout the small. I am unsure of the legality of influencing the selection of leases, but maybe a provision can be made in the MCCD guidelines or the deal with Gerding Edlin can be negotiated to include specific requirements for retail and dining space leases, uh, for example, approval from the RDA. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. Um, Janice, I will move to you next. Give me just a second. Okay, you should be able to unmute yourself now, Janice. Yeah, there. You can hear me now? Yes. Uh, thanks, everyone. Hey, I, I want to give a big uh, support to what Alex said. I think he made some really valid points about what will be a real draw for the downtown um, national chains versus local. Local. <laughs> okay, so hello board, city leaders and staff. You guys know me. I've been a Murray resident living in the historic neighborhood just east of downtown Murray for 27 years. Even though I was not raised here, I feel my roots have dug deep into this amazing community. And I really want to commend each of you for the diligent work you are doing to help move Murray into the future. There is a lot of responsibility in the decisions you are asked to make now. Knowing these changes can forever alter Murray and will last for generations. I appreciate your desire to build on the solid foundation created by those who have gone before you. Today and ongoing, as the board reviews the Edelin project proposal and others, I ask the board to carefully consider these questions. A hallmark of Murray's beginnings was its diversity welcoming people from all walks of life and creating a unique downtown. How is this project enhancing diversity and building on what makes Murray one of a kind? Does this project promote diversity in both population and businesses? Okay, that's my first set. Next set, highly valued components of an engaging and vibrant downtown are local businesses, mom and pop shops and startup companies. And how does this project support and encourage these businesses to come to downtown Murray? And, and again, now I'd like, I'm gonna quote from the proposed design review guidelines for the MCCD that are under, it's under value one authentic quote, Development in the MCCD area should be thoughtful, purposeful, and representative of the true heart of Murray City. When someone travels along State Street and reaches the buildings which have close proximity to the street between 4800 South and Vine Street, they know they have arrived in Murray." End quote. So question, 
Does this project harmonize with the surrounding built environment that has been the mark of arriving here in Murray? And always to ask, will such a development enhance or detract from Murray's charm? I thank you for your time. And as a citizen of Murray, I really do trust that you will be ever diligent in your responsibility for honoring what has made Murray what it is today and building upon that identity as we move into a bright future. Thank you. Thanks, Janice. Um, okay, Emily, I will, Give me just a second, I will give you the opportunity to speak. And then Jay, we did just have another email come through. So when Emily's done, if you want to read that one. Oh dear. Shoot, we just lost Emily. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, Jay, if you want to just read that, the one that sure. just came in, and maybe let's give Emily a minute to rejoin. Okay. It says, Dear Board, the Murray Area Chamber of Commerce ex is excited to see our local government's continued investment into the economic development of Murray's downtown. This part of our city has the potential to be a humming engine of commerce and the plans put forward by the contractor the board has selected look like a great balance of uses that will make it a destination for residents and businesses alike. As the process moves from the conceptual to the practical phases, the chamber is hopeful that the business will be an active participant in the development discussion. We are confident that our insight into Murray's econ economy will help make the project as engaging and productive part of our community as possible. Sincerely, Joseph Silverzweig, board member, Murray Area Chamber of Commerce. Okay, let me just check and see. Um, I have not seen her enter in again. And I, I fear I may have accidentally right clicked on removing her from the meeting instead of allowing her to talk. So I just have emailed her and if it's okay with you, um, Chair, Chairman, if she responds back and enters the meeting again, could we allow her to speak later on in the meeting? Absolutely. If she hooks back up, we're uh, system comments are very important to all of us. So if she, if we get her back on, uh, let's interrupt whatever we're doing and and uh, give the time to her. Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure that's what happened, but my if if it is, that's like my worst case fear ever. So. I just resent her confirmation email for registering for the meetings and I've emailed her personally as well. So we'll see if we can get her back on and my apologies for that. Oh, that's all right. We'll move on. Do we have any others? It does not look like it. Okay, why don't we move on to the workshop presentation and discussion. And if she uh, comes back on, Feel free to interrupt and let's go to her. Okay. Um, Jay, while I'm presenting, can you just maybe look for that and try and contact yeah. as well? I'll keep an eye out for her. Okay, thank you. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, hold on. Okay. When we met earlier this month with uh, the, the chair and the vice chair, they suggested, or actually I think it was in December, they suggested that we have a workshop to 
discuss with the RDA board as an entire entity um, some of the history of what's happened with uh, the Central Business District and the MCCD zone since the property we've been looking at that the RDA owns at 4800 South State Street is in the Central Business District and the MCCD zone. So we've taken some time to put together some slides here that should give you just kind of like a brief, a brief history of how we got here and some of the things that lay ahead of us with the project and where we anticipate going from here. So I wanted to just give a real brief overview of the Central Business District. It was formed in 1979. That's probably before a couple of our council members were even born. Um, hey, Melinda. Yeah. Uh, are you okay to take questions for anybody as we go, or you want to say? Oh, yeah, until yeah, please. If you, um, yes, please. If you have questions along the way, please um, just interrupt and ask. Um, okay, I, thank you. Um, I also should say that I've got Jared here with me that later on in the presentation, he'll kind of walk through the process and what will happen from here on out based on what the MCCD ordinance says. So. Um, yes, feel free to ask questions if you have any. Um, so as I was saying, the, the Central Business District or the CBD was formed in 1979. It initially was given a 32 year time frame for the project period to, or for the project area to be active. It was triggered in 1983. I think I was in the second grade. Um, so with that 32, time, 32 year time period, the initial, expiration was set to be in 2014. In 2010, the city and the RDA went through the process to have the project area extended for another 20 years, and that has the area since it would have initially expired in 2014. So all total, the project area, when it is concluded, will have had uh, 54 years, if my math is correct. Brenda can check me on that. Um, I wanted to go over just a little bit of background too with the MCCD zone. We had a lot of changes to this um, recently, and some of that is really what led us to be where we are right now. But in 2018, we had a project come forward that was presented to the RDA board. This was prior to my time, but the project was pre presented to the RDA board and at the time the MCCD zone had unlimited height uh, allowed, so no height restrictions were in place. And the RDA board at that time did not really want to see something that tall come forward and be constructed. So. In 2018, I think it was in uh, August of 2018, the city council amended the MCCD zone and removed that unlimited height provision and added in a height restriction to 135 feet or 10 stories. So that was changed in 2018. I started with, the, with uh, Murray City in 2019 and Part of what I was tasked with when I first started was to kind of look at the area uh, in the downtown and see um, what may have led to no growth or development taking place there. Um, and so we as a division reviewed our ordinance and in early 2019, I sent out a survey to the RDA board slash city council, asking them some of the most important elements of the MCCD. And based on that survey, then we, we held a workshop in, um, I think it was kind of mid spring of 2019, where we had the opportunity to go more in depth into dialogue of some of the survey results and some of the directions that, um, that we could go in that might be more helpful to have development take place versus the really the 40 years that the property um, in the State Street area, the Central Business District has kind of sat and not really had a lot of development. So based on those conversations, we 
moved forward with an ordinance revision that we started in the summer of 2019. And in November of 2019, we brought that revised ordinance forward to the city council for adoption. And the, the main points that we had with the ordinance revision was that we wanted to simplify the process in the ordinance we wanted to modify the historic preservation portion, which really had been seen and viewed as a barrier to having development take place. And so based on those two things, uh, we brought forward an ordinance to the city council. Uh, the recommendation that we had from staff uh, actually removed the MCCD design review committee but the planning commission felt like that was an important part of the ordinance to keep and ultimately the city council agreed with that so there was an ordinance that was passed in november of 2019 and the ordinance kept the mccd drc but also kept the modifications that we had proposed on the historic preservation and simplifying the process in other areas we didn't uh we didn't modify any of the hype um but mainly just simplified the process. And uh, we also that year had gone through the process to modify the ordinance from the re requiring of sustainability through the name brand of the lead process to uh, allowing the state high performance building process to be followed uh, as an alternative. So those were the changes that we made in 2019. And that led us really to the ability for us in 2020 to put forward an RFP for the property that the RDA owns at 4800 South State Street. So I wanna just go over some of the details that we had, um, or some of the details regarding the, the RFP. In March, well, on March 21st of last year, we brought a draft of the RFP to the board through our attorney client privilege to board to review the RFP before we put it out to public uh, uh, for opening the, the process for proposals. And based on some of our history with the downtown area and uh, development that we've had in the past that didn't come to fruition, we wanted to be really cautious with the RFP process and make sure that we protected the integrity of that process. So when we sent the draft of the RFP to the board for comment, we sent that under attorney-client privilege. We received comments back from the board a few days later on March 25th, and then uh, I sent a memo to the RDA board on April 7th that addressed some of the comments that we had received and how we followed up with those comments. We ended up opening the RFP on April 6th, 2020. It was open for 90 days, uh, give or take. It closed on July 10th. And during that time, we only allowed communication through the state's website for the, um, the state's procurement website. So again, we wanted to maintain the integrity of the RFP and make sure that if there were questions that were asked, that they were asked through that system so that we could track and monitor those questions and then give the same information to all of the people who were interested in responding to the RFP. I personally sent the RFP out to probably over a hundred different developers and groups that may have uh, hopefully had an interest in that. Um, the RFP closed again, as I said, on July 10th, we received a total of five proposals. Sorry, yeah. um, how many of those, how many people outside of the state did you send the RFP to in terms of developers or was it just in state? Um, it was both, I, I couldn't tell you, I'd have to go back and look. Um, but we had, we had a list of a bunch of developers that we've been tracking within the planning division that we know have done 
work within the state, um, even if they were out of state, and a lot of the developers that we know have done work in, in Murray. So I, I think, honestly, probably most of them were local developers, but I know, um, I know, for instance, that I sent one to um, Center Cal. Uh, I think, oddly enough, Edlin was not one of those that was on my list. But that's the beauty of using the state's procurement website is that they themselves have uh, a list. Uh, individuals will go in, firms, architectures, developers will go in and they will create an account in that site. And, uh, and basically they'll go in and kind of select, here's the type of RFPs that we're interested in. And so um, that could have been, you know, how some of them received word of that, but we did our best to try and get the word to um, local developers and those that we know have done work in Utah primarily. So that's a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, again, we received five proposals uh, that we just deemed to be responsive. That means that they met all of the requirements that the RFP had in place and we took those proposals then we worked again alongside with um with gl critchfield as our legal counsel and with our procurement specialist with brooke smith to um to create a committee and to communicate to the committee the proposals and to Initially, we, we went through, we gave each of the committee members a scoring sheet. They went through those and we created a short list of firms that we wanted to bring back and have uh, in-person discussions with. So again, wanting to make sure that we maintained the integrity of the entire process from start to finish. We had the interviews, they were with the two firms that we selected to be shortlisted. Those were held in September. And at the end of the day, the discussion, the entire committee had the same, uh, the same firm to forward to the RDA as the top firm to be considered for approving the exclusive negotiation agreement. We, I actually, okay, so yeah, I think that data is correct. So on November 19th, then we brought that firm, the Eden Company, uh, forward to the RDA agreement, negotiated with them. And that passed as a vote of three to two. I should add that uh, kind of through the, the, the middle of this, the, uh, the proposal came in under girding Eden, but they let us know through our discussion period that they were um changing the name of their company essentially and that's that's now the Edlin company is is who we've uh, selected so again that vote was was sent to um there was passed by the RDE board as a vote of three to two so one of the things that we wanted to discuss with the board today and have a dialogue about is the kind of what we anticipate going forward from from here on out and some of the topics that we've selected for discussion were based on some of the comments that we heard from the rda board as you discussed the exclusive negotiation agreement on the november 19th meeting and some of the uh, comments and questions that came out of the presentation that Edlin gave to to you all so um, again, one of the things that we wanted to communicate was what the MCCD regulates and what kind of is regulated by market considerations. So the MCCD ordinance does regulate quite a few things and that's where um, we go back and say, okay, density is already regulated by what we have on the books with the ordinance. And so up to 100 units, Jared can correct me if I'm wrong, but up to 100 units per acre is allowed at this area or on this property. The height is also already regulated by 
the ordinance. We discussed that a little bit earlier that a couple of years back, the RDA board and the council didn't, didn't like what they saw and so they changed that. Um, public improvements are also regulated by the ordinance, meaning uh, open space, meaning um, the size of sidewalks. Another item that's already, already regulated by the MCCD ordinance is parking. And we'll discuss parking a little bit more in detail in a few minutes, but also uses are governed by the MCCD ordinance right now. Uh, at one point last year, we had an individual come forward and want to put a manufacturing plant in the MCCD zone, and we needed to let them know that that wasn't an allowed use in the MCCD zone. So those uses are already, uh, already set by the ordinance. And then designed to a limited scale or to a limited point is set by the ordinance as well. So that's where you're going to get your bidding, building scale. Um, that kind of goes to setbacks and then the ordinance requires that the buildings be constructed with traditional materials and so that's where you're going to get like your, um, your your requirement to have mostly glass on the bottom floor so you have that pedestrian scale um, and then the process is also regulated by the MCCD ordinance. Some of the things that have been discussed um, also are, more, are dictated by market or financial conditions. And these would be specific to whatever developer we choose to move forward with. In this case, that's Edlin Company. So Edlin has their own business model. They have their own, um, their own group that they use for uh, figuring out their financing and they will do market studies. Any developer is gonna come in and do market studies. And that's what dictates a large extent for density and height. Now, you'll notice again, we talked about those that the MCCD ordinance dictates those as well. And so if, if a developer were to come back and say, well, we can't make this project pencil out, we need to go to 200 feet, we can say, well, sorry, that's not allowed by our height and so by our height regulations and so, you need to you know, reconfigure your financing or do whatever you need to on your end to make that pencil out or the project is just doesn't move forward. It's the same thing with density as well. If, if a developer came back and said, look, we, we can only make this project pencil out at 200 units per acre and it only allows 100 units per acre, then that's just a project that can't go forward with the way they envision it to be because the ordinance it same goes for if they were to come back and say, okay, we want to push the limits and we want to have a 135 foot building. That's something that we would need to allow because the ordinance already dic dic dictates that. And same with the density. Uh, another, uh, just kind of a side note, but the density is calculated based on the overall uh, area of the site. And so if half of this, uh, just as an example of half of the site was used for a parking garage and the north the north half of the site was where the residential density was, um, the density would still be calculated over the entire site, which would include the parking area. So just because they were using, you know, half of the northern half of a structure or of the property for the residential doesn't mean that they would be limited to just maybe those two acres on the north half where they were putting that. They would be calculated for the entire four acres where the parking was going as well as the residential. Um, some of the conversation that was brought up in November talked about, uh, you know, rental versus ownership of, of residential units. And that's something that really is dictated by the market and something that really we should not get involved in. Um, if we do, we, sh we would need to be prepared for some <laughs> impacts to how a project would pencil out for a, a developer based on their own business model. So that's something that really is kind of dictated by the market and financial versus um, 
an ordinance, which is why we don't have that in the MCCD zone. Also, and this was mentioned in the public comments, but commercial space tenancy, that is dictated by the uses of the um, zone that are already spelled out in the MCCDZ, MCCD. And so where, you know, we could say, yes, we're looking for some type of a, a retail or a grocer, um, the dictating of exactly who goes into what spaces is just something that should be left up to the developer and to the market. And they will, you know, be able to um, hopefully adjust the rates, the lease rates to the market that, you know, would work to get those uses that we would desire. But at the end, that's really something that is, um, that is up to them as the, the developer and the property owner to bring in those tenants. And then lastly, we wanted to just speak a little bit to design. So you notice we did mention to a limited degree design is dictated by the ordinance. And we'll talk a little bit more, um, Jared will talk a little bit more too about the design guidelines. But as far as, you know, design, if somebody wanted to create something that, that, that was very reminiscent of the, you know, nine, early 1900 State Street, um, that's not something really that we would dictate. If they wanted to create a project that was very modern, um, that's not something that we would dictate. That's really something that would be uh, up to the developer. But can you explain what's in the MCCD now design review guide because isn't that already dictated in the review or in the guidelines? Um, so to, to some extent, yes. Um, and if it's okay with you, uh, board member Dominguez, if we can kind of just maybe, if we can answer that question in a couple more slides when we get to that point, would that be okay? Okay, thanks. Um, so this is really where I kind of want to talk a little bit about the process from here going forward. And uh, Jared will, will be much more informed about answering your question, Chair, or, um, excuse me, Board Member Dominguez, and, and discussing the process from here going forward. But um, again, I mentioned that the MCCD ordinance as it stands and as it was approved in November of 19 is what dictates the process be from here on out. Um, and so we are anticipating that we would follow that process. Some of the comments, again, going back to the November meeting revolved around uh, a public input type of a process and pu getting public comments. That is something that we can do. Um, that's something that Edlin Company is willing to do. That is required as a as a separate piece to the process as it stands in the ordinance. So we do have a public process established for all of our um, all of our projects that come through the MCCD and they go through the design review committee and then the planning commission. And those meetings are publicly noticed. And at the planning commission level, there's an opportunity for the public to comment. Um, but if it's, if it's uh, okay, Jared, I'll just kind of turn the time over to you to go forward from here on out with kind of what the process looks like. And, um, and then um, if we can, maybe when we get to the design guidelines slide, um, address uh, the question that board member Dominguez brought up just a moment ago. Sure, <clears throat> no problem. Um, so yeah, great. And then just jump in and ask any questions as you have them. Um, like Melinda mentioned, there is a, a process to every project that comes to the MCCD or in the MCCD zone that being one of them, uh, or the, the potential prog project there at 4800 South and State Street being one of them. The um, pre-application, so interestingly in, in, the, in the MCCD, every project is required to go through a pre-application conference, which means that they'll, the developers would, would spend some time with planning staff 
and potentially with other staff as well, talking through the the uh, application before it's fully formed, um, getting some input on the process, on the design standards, and and uh, getting an idea of what, what would be needed for a full application. When they do make that full application, that next step, the actual design review application, it used to be called Certificate of Appropriateness. In November of 2019, we changed that terminology to be design review application. Um, when they made that full application, we would prepare to schedule it for that review. And that first step, is, as Melinda mentioned, is with the design review committee. To get ready to go to the design review committee, we look for input from any city department staff that hasn't had a chance to comment yet uh, in pre-application, engineering, fire, uh, building department, um, water and sewer, everybody. And we get ready to go to the design review committee. Um, design review committee, as Melinda mentioned, is a public meeting also. We, um, we make that available, but we, we don't take comments at the de design review committee, although technically we don't. Sometimes we actually do, just it's a pretty, it's a more informal meeting. It's a, it's a good meeting. Um, the design review committee will go over the project and oftentimes at design review, it, it's, um, it's referred back to the design review committee again for some changes, but sometimes it's just moved forward with a recommendation. They're a recommending body. They don't make any approvals. They recommend the project to the planning commission and say it needs this or that change or with this condition, we're okay with it, uh, et cetera. So after that design review committee has made the recommendation, it goes to the planning commission for a public hearing. That's noticed to neighboring property owners for certain distances, depending on the size of the project. And then that planning, com planning commission's review of the project and the recommendation to the design review committee is a public hearing. So we'll take comments from the public at that meeting as well. And then the planning commission has to make their decision. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Melinda. As a part of that decision, the planning commission, there is in the code that was adopted in, in 2019, a kind of a standard of review for any design review approval that might be granted by the planning commission. So they're supposed to review it for conformance with the requirements of the title, meaning anything else that's contained in there, the landscaping regs, the planning of uh, the parking regs, um, other, other processes. But then also that these other uh, five items, that the project's in general conformance with the current general plan. So we do a general plan review and make sure that it's supporting and, and meeting those objectives and things, that it's in general conformance with any specific area plan that might encompass it, um, depending again on the project's location, different project plans or area plans might be in effect. That uh, third, that the project would conform to the requirements of the applicable sections of the land use ordinance. So again, it's kind of a catch-all Title 17 applies, even though it's just in the MCCD zone. Fourth, that it doesn't jeopardize health, safety, or welfare, and that's a standard kind of a review standard. And then fifth, that the project's in harmony with the purpose of the MCCD zone, and that it adheres to the principles of the design guidelines. Um, so this is kind of, these are the kind of things we'd be looking at as, as staff and the DRC to recommend to the commission that it either does or doesn't do these things. And the fifth item there, design guidelines, is, is one of the things that uh, board member Dominguez mentioned. Can you go to the next slide, Melinda? I think I have, or I think we had something about the design guidelines. So the, the way that the current ordinance reads in the MCCD zone, it says the guidelines that have been adopted shall be consulted during the review of proposed development in order to provide guidance, direction, and options which will further the stated purposes of the MCCD. Wherever practicable, development should adhere to the objectives and principles contained in the design guidelines. Um, and then I guess go to go to the next slide. We can talk about, I think, is there another slide about this or? Yeah, no, actually go back to design guidelines. So right now we're, we're in the midst of working on the adoption of the newer design guidelines, the new proposed design guidelines. The existing design guidelines have a lot of different um, aspects to them. Um, all Jared, of those things, yeah, go ahead. Um, can you go to the, to the last slide, the slide before this one? Yeah, please. Yeah. No, the one, one where it says we're practicable. Oh, uh, let's see. So it's gonna be the design guidelines slide, Melinda, if you go. Yeah, so wherever practicable, the developments should adhere to the objectives and principles contained in the design guidelines. Is that the part you're talking about? Yeah, what does that mean? It's the statement being that where, it's, where we're looking at it, it's just kind of a, an attempt to say, where we're able to do it, these developments should adhere to these objectives and principles, meaning that you've got 50 pages of different principles. You, you shouldn't throw out a, a project just because they weren't able to check off every single box for every single one of those items. 
So there's there's going to be cases. There are going to be cases in developments where they're not where you're able to point to it and say, well, it doesn't actually do that particular sub item in that particular design guideline. So we don't we don't approve. That's not the intent of the design guidelines. It's supposed to be a, a standard of review where we're looking at them and consulting them and saying, look, this is an appropriate development because it does hit these basic these basic tenets. It's that's the intent there is to say it's not going to check off every single box. It's not going to be able to. Jared, please go ahead. Um, this statement, I'm looking at the current design, what we have for MCCD is not in the current one. Is this in the new one or what well, page can I find this statement? Do you mean in the design guidelines? Because this is in the code. This is in the MCCD zone. Oh, it's in the code. Yeah, okay. this is in the actual ordinance in the, in the MCCD zone in Title 17. So okay. not in the guidelines themselves. This is just referring to those guidelines. Okay. Not the code. I was trying to get a clarification on Yeah, that. no, you bet. Jared, if I can interject sure. on a couple points. So uh, that's, a, again, another great question, Rosalba, thank you. So this, this is pasted right from the code. And to go back to the changes that we made in the, the distinction between the November 19 MCCD zone that was adopted and what was on the books before, there were a lot of very stringent uh, guidelines and the code actually said that we shall follow the guidelines, um, which when you have that in an ordinance, it makes it non-negotiable and, um, and something that you have to do. So we felt like each project, each site should be evaluated on its own merits. And that's where, um, going to board member Turner's question, that's where the wherever practicable comes in. So as an example, one of the items that was in the code before was that there be an entrance to, like a ground level entrance to a building every 75 feet. And as we went through the city hall review process, we realized that's not something that is always practicable uh, in this case because of security issues with our police department we can't have an entrance every 75 feet if there were to be a large retailer like a grocery store um, they may not be able to have an entrance every 75 feet and so those are some of the changes that um, that we put in the ordinance but there's kind of at least one example of how um, based on what an actual project is, how it comes forward to the, uh, the DRC, how some of those design guidelines may be implemented or not based on each case specific scenario. Great. So Melinda, <clears throat> so how open are we to whatever is practicable, <laughs> that word is, um, I mean, it seems to me a lot of things could be changed as a result, and that could be interpreted, um, you know, pretty loosely. So that's that's why I that's an interesting phrase. Can I make a comment on that, actually, Melinda? Because I think that the I think that the the the, the city hall example is with City Hall, it wasn't practicable. Let's, but let's say, for example, that it wasn't a grocery store or somebody else coming in, but a, 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 a development that just, that had three or four different, was a full block and had four different street frontages and wanted no entrances on any of them except for one. Well, that's not, that, that's a, a gross violation of our kind of, of our intent, and we could say to the planning commission as a staff, this is really to let us as a staff rely on something when we're making a suggestion, like it's not appropriate to allow them to do this with no entrances whatsoever on three blocks, because there's no practical reason that they need that other than that they just don't like the idea, or they don't want the design to be that way, or they're going against kind of the purposes of our zone. And so we're recommending against it. We, we want somewhere to hang our hats, but design guidelines are not intended to be they'd be called design standards as opposed to design guidelines if they were meant to be applied and checked off every single time. So we needed something that we could rely on when things were grossly mismanaged in a development project, but not absolute requirements. The absolute requirements we wanted left in the code itself in Title 17 without the design guidelines. So 
now the standard that Melinda quoted, 75, one entrance every 75 feet, you're supposed to still average entrances every 75 feet unless you have some specific reason that you're signing that it can't be done, security concerns, et cetera. And that's all written into code. It doesn't need to be part of the design yeah. guidelines because we have code for it. So it's, that's, the, that's kind of the, the balance in there, I think. Okay, so it goes both ways then. Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you. You bet. And that, and another thing too to answer that question is, is that depends on, you know, what the DRC committee feels like as far as is that element of the design guidelines being met? Is is the um, the overall project purpose um, or the overall MCCD ordinance purpose being accomplished by the project? So they do have some flexibility with that um, as as they see fit. And again, as as each project would come forward. Yeah, if I might, I think we uh, we need to have an open house public comment of some type, one or however many we, we feel necessary, earlier the better. So as this is designed, the public can have their input on it and maybe, maybe it can affect the design, maybe it can't, it just depends on what, what uh, it is. But I think the more public input we have, uh, earlier on in the project, the better the public can feel about it and the better the project will be. Uh, it's kind of late once it's designed to say, oh, shoot, we should have done this. Somebody had a good idea. So I think we need to, uh, I know they're, they're open to it. I think we need to do that as soon as we can in the design phase so something may not be overlooked. I totally agree on that. Yeah, I do too. I think it's really important that we have citizen buy-in. So I will say I do appreciate this conversation being had. And sorry if I'm nitpicking. I just want to make sure I know where to reference this when I am talking to constituents. But just going over these steps and the process is a good start. But I do agree with Dale that we need to have the buy-in happen as soon as possible. And however that looks, I mean, I know it's, you know, one word versus another, but we really have control of how we, we can bring the public in. And I think we have an advantage on how we do that too. And that's something to think about. Yeah, I have had some preliminary discussions with the Eland team and they are open to, even though again, it's not re required by our process apart from the planning commission public hearings, but they are open and willing to have some type of an engagement process. And we've agreed as well that earlier on the better, uh, the last thing we would wanna do is, is have some comments or some issues come forward that would cause them to spend a lot of money in redesign of the project. So we've discussed having, um, you know, some, some type of a process scheduled once they get through really kind of the, the site plan and a more refined concept uh, than they have right now. Um, so before like all of the design uh, level like schematics are produced, um, but a more refined concept than what was presented to the board in November. Really great thing about Evelyn is they have a lot of experience with the public involvement process. So they feel like this is something that they could do internally with their own team. Obviously with the pandemic going on, we may have to have some kind of creative uh, comment period through um, electronic means or Zoom meetings or something like that. But, um, but that's something that they're willing to do and something that as we move forward with them, in the, the near future here, we'll get more refinement on timing and, and concepts. And that would be a really great opportunity, not only for the public to comment, but for the RDA board members, for you all to comment as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. But like I said, earlier the better, so we don't get too far down this, this uh, 
too far along with this project yeah. before we do have that. Um, Jared, do you want, do you want to just address real quick because you mentioned something a minute ago about the design guidelines versus kind of like development standards? Yeah. So you maybe want to just address that real quickly. Sure. Um, it's it's a it's a good it's a good it's a good point. The, the, that distinction is that there are a lot of cities that that do design guidelines and actually have a separate document that's development standards as well. We elected rather than, and, and in that case, you have a really simple zoning code that just outlines uses, et cetera, and then the, the design of buildings and all of the improvements and everything is contained in those design guidelines and development standards. We elected to do, because of the format of the ordinance as it existed before in November last, in 2019, we elected to do design guidelines, but to have the development standards just contained within the ordinance itself. So we don't have development standards as a separate document like we do design guidelines, just the, uh, just the stuff that's contained in the ordinance in 17170. So you're going to find a lot of those standards there. And that's where you see things like the hard numbers, the 100 units per acre and uh, all buildings, 50% of all building frontages within 12 to 18 feet of the back of the curb and gutter, et cetera, those kind of hard standards that are measurables, quantifiable things, height standards, the 135 feet and the, the various height standards that we have. Um, those are just contained in the ordinance instead of in a, in a document, a separate document like design guidelines or development standards. So that's really, that's really kind of how that's laid out. Um, okay, so um, unless, unless anyone has any more questions right now on the design guidelines, I think our next slide is on parking. So we'll, we'll move to that. And I, I did want to convey a little bit of information to the RDA board. Um, th this is something that's been consistently mentioned, not only with the RDA, but with the city council. And so I wanted to shed some light on some of the parking issues, um, specifically over in the fire clay area as we see them. And I apologize because I wasn't able to put a finger on um, like the exact language and a development agreement that led to these things. But um, if, if you'll walk back with me in time to last, oh geez, uh, last year when we took to the city council the memorandum of understanding with Kimball Development on the Kmart site. Um, that MOU was guided by phasing and timing. And one of the things that we, and I specifically remember Jared saying this, is that um, we're requiring that the parking structure be constructed up front. And parking structures are something that are very expensive for developers to build. So it's something that you want to require up front that they build and construct, otherwise you run the risk of never having that happen. So going back to fire clay in 2009, there was a development agreement that was approved by the RDA board for the fire clay investment partners. Um, the uh, project had three phases and the third phase, unfortunately, was the parking structure. So a lot of the parking issues that were created over in Fire Clay really were a subset of poor phasing on that RDA development agreement. Um, so the developer built the first two phases and the third phase also involved the property that was factory that still exists over there. So uh, another issue with that was just that the, the third phase in the parking structure was, was uh, completely founded on uh, acquiring property that really the developer had no way to ensure they acquired. So between, between that, the, the property was never able to be acquired and the developer essentially ended up walking away. And so over in Fire Clay, we have an entire parking structure that was never built. Um, and so that's, that's a lesson that, you know, was learned by the city however long ago, 12 years ago, 
some a mistake that we definitely wouldn't want to make again and something that we've learned from. So, uh, you know, any anything that would be brought to the RDA board or the city council would have that parking structure, that parking required up front. Um, so, so just one element as to why there was um, the parking issues that were created over in Fire Clay. And what I have not been able to put my finger on um, is that there, there's a discussion or rumors that have said that previously at some point the development discussions or agreement allowed the developer to include on-street parking as part of their parking totals. Um, we're, we're researching that and I haven't been able to find that. Um, if that. If that were to be true, that's something that our ordinance wouldn't allow for right now. So I just wanted to give a little bit of perspective on uh, issues that were created in the fire clay RDA area um, that, you know, based on those lessons learned, and, and I just think that we're, you know, always working smarter and better than we were previously, those are mistakes that wouldn't be made again um, with this project. So with that, um, Jared, if you want to just go over the parking as it is on the books right now. Sure, I can do that. Thanks, Melinda. The, um, just really quickly, this slide um, shows the, 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 it's a slide from 2019 when the change was being made. So the, the new maximum parkings are slightly higher, like you're seeing in that right-hand column, 1.5 and 2. And as you see at the bottom, we also made this change. Parking, um, allowed parking can exceed those maximums in this zone, as long as it's happening within the building envelope or in parking structures. So if we're not having to look at your extra parking as a parking lot that's taking up space, that ought to be something better than that, great, then you can do additional parking. But otherwise, we'll allow you to go up to one and a half spaces for two bedrooms or less, and two spaces for more than two bedrooms, or even more than that, as long as you put it in structures. To give a little context to that conversation, um, or a little more substance to that conversation Melinda was just having with you, parking structures are no laughing matter at a minimum of about $20,000 per parking stall to, to build them. You don't wanna, you don't wanna um, count on just goodwill to get those done. You get those done up front if they're gonna happen. And, and there's, there's a serious commitment on the part of a developer as well. Uh, so they've gotta mean it if they wanna exceed those parking spaces, exceed those maximums. But uh, we've seen most developers coming in wanna at least do, um, we haven't seen anybody wanting to go below our minimums. We don't require a lot because this is a high density a very urban intended environment. So uh, the, the minimums right now are one to one for uh, residential units uh, of one bedroom and then going up to the one and a half for two bedrooms. Um, to Melinda's point as well, the, the non-residential space does have a requirement. It's not very heavy, one to 500, but we get asked by people all the time, well, hey, I'm gonna have, um, I, I'm designing this project and I haven't really they, they'll design it and their first blush almost always doesn't include any easy access for commercial parking um, behind the building or, or near the building or whatever. And they're like, well, I've got the parking out front. Well, that's great. We want you to have that on street parking, but it doesn't count in your parking calculations. When we figure out how much parking you're required to have based on your square footage, you got to provide that somewhere other than the street. That's never part of the code. It might've been part of a development agreement or something in fire clay, but it was never part of of code and it certainly isn't in the downtown in the MCCD. They'll have to provide that one to 500, which isn't a lot, but it's gotta be provided outside of where the, the on-street parking might be. The on-street parking is just gravy for a project. Um, Jared? Yeah. If I could just interrupt, uh, I'd say never say never. Uh, that yeah. was actually part of the code. Oh, uh, really? And that was built and uh, was changed. The ordinance uh, was changed. Um, I'm guessing 2015, 2016, 16. In the TO, in the fire clay TOD? Yeah. In, okay. So whether that was done by a, a uh, an agreement code until oh, okay. about 20, I don't, I don't know, maybe you can remember GL when it was, um, but it, but uh, it, regardless of when it was uh, changed, it was uh, allowed when fire clay was built. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. So, yeah, and not and the MCC that we're looking at here, we we don't count it. So yeah. Um, anything else about the park? Any questions about parking other than that? 
that we want to talk about. Okay. I have a question. Um, can you, are there any other cities that have, are, are you guys following lead on other cities that have done this or who have been successful at it? Cause I know there's a lot of development going on and parking just seems to be an issue. And this yeah. is why it keeps, we keep bringing it up is because it's been an issue in other cities and we just, and we know we have fire clay as an example, but we just want to prevent it being a problem. Yeah. And maybe talk a little bit about why it was decided to do the MOU with the Cape Mark property a sure. little bit more. Yeah, we can, we can talk about that a little bit To To the first part of your question, um, the other cities that, that are dealing with the same kind of issues with, with higher density development around transit stations and, and, and in their downtowns and things, these are, these are pretty typical parking requirements. Um, 1.25 to 1.85 spaces per unit, that's pretty typical. I don't have a, a giant matrix of everybody and what they're requiring, but... Um, are other cities using MOUs too? Well, they're, they're using uh, development okay. agreements sometimes and sometimes using MOUs is, or, or development agreements of some kind are fairly common in terms of trying to control the phasing of a development, especially a mixed use one where you worry about getting things like the parking structure, the commercial development to happen instead of just getting the residential component up and then having the developer walk away before they're done with their commercial stuff. It's, it's very, very typical. Good tool. Um, that's a good, good question. Um, in, in terms of the parking in, in fire clay, where we've had the, where we had the issue on the West side of the tracks in the large, apartments there that don't really have a lot of commercial with them uh, and some of the parking problems there. We haven't seen as much of that duplicated on the east side in the newer projects and they're built to this standard like this with 1.25 or so. It's a very similar standard uh, for parking. We haven't seen the problems. There are there are fewer parking needs in those projects. They have much smaller units and not as many bedrooms, et cetera, and they're close to the track. So people make, the people taking those apartments make conscious choices about how much parking they have available and and seem to adhere so but yeah it's it's in line with what other people are doing and you see a lot of develop i don't know that they're all using memorandums of understanding that's that's kind of a, a little lesser used than just straight up development agreements but it's how we went so but same difference basically it's, it's the city agreeing with the developer as a part of the code how they're going to handle the phasing and, and when they're going to build what so would that be something that we consider with this project or is it something no. Yeah, we, yes, we, we could. I don't think it would be dictated by the code based on the project as I've seen it so far, but so far we haven't seen a lot yet. We use memorandums of understanding like with Kmart. It kicks in in two different um, situations with mixed use developments for us by code. When the project is five acres or more, which I don't think this particular 4800 block one is more than five acres, is it? It's three or something like that. So it, it, if the project's five acres or more, there's an automatic requirement for a master site plan and, a, and an MOU. Or if the project has horizontal mixed use elements or other, in other words, if there are commercial components that are required that aren't located underneath the residential component. So what I've seen so far for what they're proposing has been vertical mixed use, which doesn't trigger the MOU and the master site plan either. Um, that's not to say that we couldn't do it as the as the property owner or, or want want to to adhere to it as a city but that would be a conscious decision you'd have to make uh, um outside of the code i think because the code's not going to necessarily require it here the mou thank you jerry sure and again i'm saying all that without having seen an actual project we're only seeing concepts and things like that. i haven't reviewed anything but based on what i've seen so far i don't expect it to kick in necessarily yeah, the, the entire block is is about four acres. Yeah. Uh, so the, the requirement of an MOU would not be triggered in this instance. Uh, so interesting. I, I uh, did receive some information, a little bit more information on the fire clay parking and some of the approvals that was included with on-street parking, um, which I, I won't take the time to share that screen, but uh, maybe I'll just send that to the RDA board. Uh, that um, kind of that, that third phase that never happened and then there was uh, 834 parking spots that 
were approved and it looks like, you know, 170 of those were on street parking. Um, so, you know, that's, that's definitely, I think, a big contributor to the issues over there. Um, and thankfully, a, a lesson that we've learned from and won't, won't commit to making that mistake again. Um, if we're okay to move on from parking, um, my last slide is kind of just wanted to go over real briefly with the board, the timeline of what we expect from here on out. And then uh, we've done a lot of kind of talking to you. Um, and so I'll turn the time over for you to ask more questions or for the board to have a discussion based on some of the information that we presented today. But uh, in speaking with Edlin, uh, they, they've, looking at where we're at right now and um, the what they have based their timing on is, is a two-year construction. And the one thing that they want to avoid is having a, a winter opening. And so as we discussed the schedule, um, they essentially said, well, instead of basically the way it shakes out would lead to kind of a, a December 2023, uh, January 2024 opening, which they just didn't want to um, work through. It's, it's a very difficult time to get leases signed with the holidays. And uh, so they have targeted spring of 2024 to open with a two-year construction that backs into construction starting the spring of 2022. And then that would essentially give us as um, the DRC, the Planning Commission staff and the RDA to get all of our documents and agreements and everything, all the approvals put into place uh, through the end of this this year. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen now and um, and just kind of turn the time over to the RDA board for any additional questions or for you all to have discussion based on what we've presented today. Okay, thank you, Melinda. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions about the presentation? Okay, thank you. I think it's, I think uh, we went through the process fairly well. I think there's going to be, uh, I think it's an exciting time. And I think, I think the developers, uh, Brett and I have had an opportunity more so than the rest of you to interact with these developers. And I was very impressed with them. And that's one of the reasons they were picked. Uh, they were upfront, they were honest, they worked hard and to get the business. And I, I am excited to see how it goes in the goes forward. There again, I can't emphasize enough that I believe we need public input on this in the early stages. So when we finish, everybody has a project that they're proud of. With that, does anybody else have anything else or we'll move on with the agenda? Dale, just, just another comment. I think that it's a really yeah. good idea to involve the citizens in the process as soon as possible. I'm also wondering, you know, it sounds like it's going to be <clears throat> all small, medium rental units. And uh, I'm just wondering if there's any way we can work diversity into it. It sounds like um, we really don't have any say in that area. Is that true, Melinda? Yeah, that really that's, that's dictated by the market. Um, I mean, I, we're happy to have conversations with them about that, but, um, you know, essentially, uh, any developer is going to do a market study and they're going to want to try and hit what that market study comes back with pretty closely so that they don't end up with a bunch of units that, uh, you know, that they can't rent. Um, I seem to recall in recent conversations something about uh, being asked to include, uh, you know, a few three bedroom units um, and maybe that was even at Murray Crossing, but but those were some of the more difficult units for them to lease. So it's, it's, 
it's a dialogue that we can definitely have, but in the end, you know, our performa and their finances that really should dictate um, the size of the units and the number of bedrooms. And whether they're um, owner or renter or renter um, or whether they're, you know, what prices what? they are. I mean, if they're middle income or, you know, it sounds like they're going to kind of be high income. Um, I just have concerns about that. And I think our citizens will too, from everything I've been hearing. So I will, wish will you we... put a conversation on your dog to have with them. So we, we can get an answer for that, Melinda. Yeah. And I, I believe there's also regulations with the, uh, the, Fair, the Fair Housing Act that would prohibit us from regulating some of those things, but we, we can get more information to you on that. Thank uh, you. I and just wish there were more diversity in it. It just, I mean, it just seems to be, you know, all, all one standard. And uh, I wish it were more flexible. And I'm wondering if there's any way we can make it, make it may not be the word, but have it be considered. Uh, so let me dig a little bit deeper into your, your comment about you know, not, not a lot of diversity. Do you, do you mean um, do you mean the size of units that they proposed or are you speaking more to the income level? Mm -hmm. I'm speaking to that. Um, I'm also speaking to uh, whether it's ownership or all rentals, whether it could be a mix of those things. I mean, you know, everything that I have, I have learned and, and studied says that a mix is, is the best way to go, especially in those areas. And I'm wondering if we can't have more of a mix, if there's some way we can, we can do that rather than just having it all be uh, expensive apartments that they're going to end up requiring you know, several people to be able to, to, to afford them, if you know what I mean. I mean, if you understand. And that also speaks, again, to the parking. Um, you know, that's, that's my concern, and I think that's going to be a lot of our citizens' concern. That's what I keep hearing. So, okay. Okay, anyway. Thanks. thanks for going a little bit deeper on, on answering that. So that's definitely a conversation, uh, a concern to pass along to uh, Edlin um, and passing that along earlier versus later and waiting until we get to that public involvement portion. Um, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I, I, did, I did have just one other piece of information that... Um, real, quick, real quick, Malika, I just, I just want to add on real quick. I just would be surprised if Elon, they seem so, what Diane just said, they seem so, um, what's the word I want to say, so favorable to that when we were talking to them. So I'd be, I'd, you know, didn't you feel that, Melinda? They seem to be pretty on board on a lot of things like that. So anyway, it was a yeah, great I, question. I think they want to be sensitive to the concerns that are expressed. Um, but but I think they're also you know they've been doing this long enough to know too that they're they're realists and there are some things that you know the public uh, may have an opinion and express input on but something that may not be able to be included for one reason or another. Um, but they're they're willing to have you know, those discussions. Um, Brooke had sent some information through the chat that I just thought was worth passing along and it relates back to. A question, uh, Board Member Dominguez, that you asked about the RFP process, and um, through the state uh, RFP software, whatever the state system, 259 vendors total were notified through that system, in addition to about the hundred or so that I had notified on my own. So some of those could be crossover, but that just gives you a good idea of. Um, how many we were able to hit. So I think that's, you know, we did a great, and coming up with five, I, I was, when we when we put this, you'll recall, when we put this RFP out, um, COVID had just hit. And I was really concerned about getting any responses at all. Um, 
And so the fact that we came back with really five proposals that I, I think, you know, any of those proposals would have been viable, I think was a really, to me, that shows that the changes that we made to the ordinance that, you know, to help, to, to help and straightforward. And then also just the desire of desire of ability of having um, property owned on 48th and State Street is is definitely um, an area that is, you know, in high demand, it's especially when we um, when we take into account the changes that we're putting in place too with the city hall being constructed. So um, I think that was a, a huge thing that we were able to get five proposals back. Dale, can I make one more comment? Absolutely. Um, I guess the idea of it just being market driven really grates at me because it seems it seems so so cold and and I think we need to have under other considerations. Um, you know, we're dealing we're dealing with with where we're taking our city. And so I think I think it needs to be more than market driven. So again, I support um, Dale's saying that we need to we need to include the community and we need to do it as soon as possible. So thank you. I'm done. Can I jump in for a sec? You bet, Kat. Um, so I just wanted to say I, I'm grateful that everyone seems on the same page as far as the sooner the public input, the better. And I think that that's really important. Um, and as far as the types of units, um, any information at all you can give us, um, uh, you know, when you come back as far as, um, you know, if it can be something different, sorry, um, I'm distracted now, stop. Um, okay. If it, uh, she hears my voice and she assumes I'm talking to her. So um, she's very excited. Is it like, as far as rental versus owned or can a certain percentage be, you know, affordable housing of if that isn't the case of the why and whether it's in code or whether it's because it's out of our purview, but the more information we have helps us, I think, communicate to our residents of the direction we're going and why. Um, so I'm really grateful for any, you know, further clarifications and, and like Rosalba pointed out earlier, um, the where to find it so that we can um, help explain it as clearly as possible because it, it can be confusing even on the inside of, I know we made the decision because, you know, of these reasons, but then trying to backtrack is confusing. So this was really helpful. Thank you for this whole sort of review of the process. Um, it was helpful to see it clearly laid out. Um, and then my question from there is, uh, when's the next time it comes before us for any type of vote? What's the next step, um, the next time it's before us and what type of decision is that as far as um, sort of the solidity of the project at that point? Um, well, let me kind of address the first half of your comments uh, first and then I'll answer that question. But um, one of the reasons why in the end we selected Eden Company over the other developer is, is based on the TIF ask that was involved. The developer that we did not end up selecting was asking for pretty much all of the increment that would be generated on the site and even some uh, in addition above and beyond what the project would generate. And, the, and Edlin was not, based on the proposal that they put in, they did not ask for any uh, increment assistance. So I think going back to, to some of these other questions of, you know, could it could it be uh, a more diverse product? Could it have some affordable housing elements in there? Um, I think the answer to that is is yes. Um, but my guess is that in return, then the ask or the request for TIF would come along with that, and that's something that obviously is a board that's um, you know that is. Uh, in the most basic sense, the entire reason why we have RDA project areas is to, is to help get projects completed that would not uh, be able to be completed on their own uh, 
but also just a caveat of the RDA has done a tremendous amount of work over the last 10 years assembling all of the parcels and bringing that to market. And that's something that uh, more than likely a private developer wouldn't have been able to do. So uh, so there's been a lot of work that's already been put in, in place to, to bring this product. So. Um, so we can we can have discussions about some of these other options and um, but my my sense is again that that would come back then with a request for increment and that would be your trade off um, if you included that don't really make sense with what the market sees out there then you have to be willing to subsidize them or provide some type of an incentive for the developer to uh, to bring that forward as a, as a product. Um, and then uh, board member Martinez to answer your question about when would the RDA board see this again? Um, essentially we're planning on following the process as it's outlined in the MCCD ordinance. And so as a project, um, you know, the, the time for the board to submit comments would be whenever we have that public meeting or the public process that Eagle has agreed to do. Um, as far as the project, now in the end, um, we will be bringing forward several items to the RDA board for consideration and those will be um, kind of paced throughout the years as we, as we get to them. Um, I do have a schedule of events that I've received from Edlin and we need to go over those. I, I just got those. We need to go over them with the attorney and with the mayor's office and make sure that we're good with what they proposed. Once, once we've um, flushed out the dates with that, we'll send that to the board. But what I would anticipate from here forward is that there will be probably two or three different agreements that we may bring to the board. Um, one would be for the sale of the property. And if, uh, you know, if, if Evelyn came back with a, a project that um, incorporated everything that, you know, that we feel like we had asked for um, and for the, um, you know, everything, meets what's required by code and they didn't need any TIF funding. In theory, that would be the only agreement that we would need to bring to the RDA board would be to sell the property to them. Um, if there is going to be any type of uh, TIF funding that gets dispersed to them, then we would have to bring forward a participation and development agreement for the RDA board to approve. Um, and so there's kind of, there's kind of everything uh, between a purchase and sale agreement and a full-fledged development agreement that may come back to the board for approval. And, uh, you know, I would think the soonest that we would be bringing something like that back to the board would be June or July. Um, so, uh, but my guess is that it would be uh, later on this year, probably more late summer, fall time. Okay, Dale, can I ask a question? You bet. So thank you, Melinda. So Melinda, let me make sure and I'll keep it brief. So if if what Diane had said and what I had mentioned with Diane about that, if, if it's not market driven, that thank you, by the way, that kind of started to jive a little more. But if that's not market driven, but it was something we're going to, we'd really like to see that. And they're saying, well, yeah, if you want to see that, then you have to ante up and through TIF or whatever. And then that's going to be on the city, which is our residence, tax money coming from our residents. Am I correct on that? Uh, well, when I say TIF, I'm saying, you know, in general, of course, it comes out in different areas, but in general, that comes from us. So, in the end, yes, uh, because it's all it's all dollars that are generated by uh, property taxes. But the the beauty and the benefit of of project areas is that um, isn't something that gets 
reimbursed or delivered back to a developer unless they perform on the development agreement. And so um, as, a, as an example, if we were to say, okay, we want to have a portion of these units be uh, affordable housing. And the trade-off was then they said, okay, we would need to have, um, let's just say $5 million of TIF to make that happen. Um, then we go forward, we would bring a development agreement to the board, similar to what we just approved in uh, last July, I think it was with the ore sampling mill, you would get reimbursed that $5 million over time as you perform what we're requiring you to perform. So that would mean that uh, affordable housing units be made available for the next 20 years. And uh, we would require then the, or that we wouldn't reimburse them a certain amount until um, their project was constructed, completed, and they were paying their property taxes. And what they would pay in those property taxes is what we would use to reimburse them for the extra um, benefit that we requested them to bring that wasn't the market rate of the affordable housing. I don't know if I explained uh, that very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and so, and, and Elon had presented to, to take none of that zero amount and others a lot more and that's part of the decision. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the other, you know, proposal really was, um, was About wanting millions? to have, you know, essentially, I think it was even above and beyond what their project would have generated over the remainder of the, um, the lifespan of the project area. And, and that's another thing to consider too, is that we were only a, really allowed to capture the additional increment off of those projects until uh, the project area expires in 2034. And so the longer this property sits and, and doesn't get developed, the less opportunity we would have to provide those additional incentives. But again, as the project was presented from Eden, um, you know, without including the DAR property as, as they presented to us, they weren't asking for any uh, assistance. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. I have a follow-up question to, to the market. So how is it determined and how do they go about finding that, that information? And, and at what point in the project do they determine that? Is that towards the end? Is it in the middle? So they, they would have, even before they, um, not before, but even while they looked at responding to the proposal, they would have conducted some type of a very basic market study. Um, I mean, I, I would assume that they would do that, most developers would. So there's a variety of firms that engage in those type of services and who who they used or who others might use, I, I don't I don't know, but um, but that would have been, uh, if you will recall from the proposal that we did send out to the board that was included in your November packet, part of what was required in the proposal was a financial statement or their pro forma. Now we did have to redact some of that information as it was considered privileged, but but that pro forma, what they brought forward would have been based on a very preliminary market study. So they, they would have been able to go in and do the math that would say, okay, here's how our business model works. Here's what the market is saying would be uh, available or would be um, marketable for this type of the zone and the density and they work their magic and they come back with this proposal that says, okay, based on A, the our, our market data and research that we have and B, our business model and financing, this is what we can, we can propose with our project and we know it'll work out for us. 
but they can go back and and see and change that if they need to or if the economy i mean there's predictions that we're going we're may go into a recession and that can change the whole market driven and it can change their project essentially right um, i mean it, it, at whatever extent they want they want to change it I yeah guess. It could, and and again, as an example, I mean, um, it, it's outside of a, an RDA project area, but uh, earlier, I keep on saying, okay, early last year, um, transitioning from 2020 to 21, um, early last year, we had a project that was approved, the Bonnie View site, and initially they had, um, Jared could, could, say the numbers, but initially they had their project approved with, I think it was about 270 units or so. Sounds right, yeah. They, they went through their process. Um, they realized that to make it pencil out, they needed to add additional units. And so last fall, I think it was in November, they amended conditional use permit and, um, and increased their density to 350 units. So, the, so there is a mechanism for a project to morph based on, I guess, additional information. Um, but my guess is that Edlin, you know, would be uh, nimble enough with and experienced enough that they would be able to to really address that upfront and not have to go back through an approval process. But if they did need to, um, that's that's what would what would happen. Um, there's always amendments to agreements um, and that's one of the things that has been so confusing and kind of trying to unwind and untangle with all of the agreements over in Fireclay is that, um, you know, some of them have five and six amendments and so, um, you know, there could potentially be an opportunity for a project once it's granted approvals either through the Planning Commission or with the RDA board to have changes made to it, but not without going back through an official approval process. So in this case, it would go back to the DRC, then the Planning Commission, and depending on what it is, maybe even us. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, I'm just trying to understand that process. Yeah. And then any, I don't know, I have I have a few questions. Do, we, do you have any other follow-ups? Can I ask a few questions, Dale? No, you bet. Okay. Um, so one of the biggest concerns, and I know we've talked about public input, and I do appreciate that Elin is willing to do that, but citizens, especially in my district, um, they feel like they're being unheard. So if we do, and this is, I think, just for the RDA in general, what are the steps after citizen comments do we take to follow up with citizens? Um, if we can just highlight that and is it something that we as a board and our district should follow up with them independently? Do you, does the staff do that? How, what's the process in that? So again, I, you asked some really, ask some really excellent questions and I'm glad we're having this conversation. So um, one, we're always in this, and this goes for any of the board members too, we're always here to answer questions. If you guys have questions about a process or a project or something that's coming before, um, the DRC or Planning Commission, please feel free to reach out. That definitely goes to citizens as well. Uh, we do spend a lot of time on the phone with uh, phone calls. Um, you know, last year we sent out over 6,000 public notices. And so that generates a lot of calls and questions. And we're very happy to answer those. Um, appreciate it when residents come to us directly so we can make sure that we get them accurate information and uh, let them know how a process works precisely versus um, maybe some of the, you know, dialogue that might take place that um, would lead to information that isn't accurate as we could give out. Um, so that being said, unfortunately, a lot of times public comments are given on items that um, the law really has determined to be public clamor. And I, I, can, I can see a smile on maybe the face of one of the attorneys as I said that, but, um, but there, there are oftentimes, unfortunately, a lot of the public comments that we 
that we get um, aren't items that can be addressed based on the ordinances and the regulations that we have put in place. So, um, you know, it, it's very hard and that's, and that's where, um, unfortunately, as city council members, RDA board members, and even as staff, we, we have to kind of be able to navigate and, and take, um, take some of those comments and help then turn around and help a resident understand that um, while they may, and as an example, while they may feel like uh, a development is going to negatively impact their neighborhood, let's say with traffic, um, we have technical staff, uh, which is the reason why we had uh, Danny Astle and Trey Stokes, our city engineer, included on the RFP review committee. Um, so that they can look at that technical data. Trey understands traffic studies. Um, he looks at those all the times and, and he can understand um, exactly how a neighborhood's gonna be impacted and whether that impact would be enough to deny a development. Not really the way the land use works. It's how then would we mitigate that impact versus denying a project. Um, I'm not sure I'm I'm really answering your question very well, but but I think I think that's helpful. Um, I think just in you know even if it's off topic, if there is a response to a citizen that has comments, um, and it was more specifically with the RDA and maybe because of what the said topic, but um, just what the follow up is. I guess I just really wanted to understand how. With, if there is follow-up, even if it's off topic or not on the agenda, how that gets addressed. Um, so that was that was just one concern, but yeah, I mean, that helps me understand. I think it's just, there's, there's a feeling of disconnect is what I'm gathering is all it is. It's just a feeling of disconnect. Um, and you kind of touched on what I was gonna, a follow-up question I was gonna ask is what goes into approving these projects um, in terms of studies, whether it's, and, and this is just more because I'm new, I'm trying to understand how this process will work and what an applicant is required to do um, when they come forward. Are there, what traffic studies are they required to do? Are there traffic studies? Is there an environmental study? Um, that was a question that I kept getting asked. I'm like, let me find out. Um, and also, how does, how does this affect infrastructure? And I know Trey and Danny kind of look into this in terms of infrastructure. And does that come in with, you know, taxes from those residents that we gather? And how do we look at um, adding additional police and fire? And I know that's a big concern right now um, that I keep hearing from residents. So, um, and, and with this project and other projects moving forward. Okay. So again, really great questions, and um, and we're always happy to help um, anyone understand the answers to these questions. So uh, let me go back to the first part of your question, which you asked about studies. So that depends. Um, if you would recall, um, and, and maybe actually the, this dialogue was taking place, I think, um, probably right around the time of the elections and maybe before you were on the council, but we did embark on having a very limited traffic study done of the 48th and State Street uh, property uh, neighborhood circulation plan. And uh, we included that information in the proposal and that way developers would have a really good taste of what would be required for the uh, the project and as far as impacts that that may come to the area based on that um, the the more pointed answer to that question is that uh, again Trey uh, Trey has the ability to require a traffic study on any project that he would feel like it would be warranted and then there's a trip a tipping point in our ordinance that says um, 
any development that brings over, is it 50 residential units, Jared, um, into, or is it 30 or four? I don't know. Uh, it's 30, uh, it, I want to say it's 30 lots or 100 resident or 100 multifamily units, but I could be wrong. Okay. But that's I, around there. That sounds, that sounds Mr. more right. And, and, and probably more to the point is why I can't really recall because it, it's kind of both. Yeah. Um, so, so there is a, a certain point where there is a traffic study that would be required. Um, as far as environmental studies, that's something that usually is required through kind of a mortgage or a financing process is that the property, before you would buy a property, you would need to have some type of an environmental study done. Uh, we have done a phase one and a phase two on the entire block of property, including the DAR property that we own. And we've done that through the Brownfields grant. Um, and so we have, we have those studies completed and we are in the process now of taking another step to get more core samples drilled and uh, so to be able to come up with a cost analysis for there there is some uh, very limited contamination on the site I think there previously have been like a dry cleaner and or a fueling station and so environmental studies um, yes that would be that would be required um, but let me let me go if you're speaking about that the federal government requires, which that's traditionally termed as an environmental study. Um, no, in this instance, uh, we would not. We would not be doing any type of a NEPA uh, study. Um, and then to to go uh, next to your question about infrastructure, we do know that there is some public infrastructure that will be impacted by this project. We know there's power lines that'll need to be relocated. And uh, we, we've already had some dialogue and discussions with the power department on trying to get some costs on what those relocations would be. And the, uh, I don't think there's any issues as far as water and I don't think there's any sewer issues. Uh, storm drain would have to be addressed through the project and that's also part of development costs um, that they would be required if there was a water line that had to be extended or expanded typically the development would pay for those costs um, and then another another thing too is um, impact fees and the, the city does have in place impact fees for sewer power, I believe, um, stormwater and for water. And uh, those impact fees should be used to help pay for any new growth that would need to uh, be developed with those services in order to, to pay for the new growth. So, uh, as an example, if, if you had a subdivision um, that was going to require that the city increase its, its water service, um, those impact fees that have been collected over the period of time could be used to drill a new well um, to get the water service increased. So um, that's some of the ways that uh, impact to services are are paid for by development. Um, primarily, it's the developer that shoulders the responsibility for those additional um, those additional infrastructure needs and services that would have to be brought in. Um, not something that really Murray has seen very much over the last well many years because of the the phase of development that we're in, right? But like um, younger cities like Harriman. Um, that's happening all the time where, you know, people are developing land and a sewer line doesn't exist out there. And so um, the impact fees can pay for the sewer line extension to that that new area that's being developed. But that that would also, um, you know, be the case with 
infill development, those impact fees um, should should be able to account for that. Um, and then uh, to to speak with uh, you know police and fire, we don't have any impact fees for police and fire. Some cities do, um, but but we don't, and so. Uh, that would just have to be addressed, you know, through a regular process of uh, the working with the police chief and the mayor and the, the city council as a budget was set and as staffing needs were determined. Okay, great. Thank you. And then lastly, um, there were some questions about just the facade and whatnot, but I'm assuming those questions could be addressed directly to the DRC when that when it's up in that phase. Is that correct? Okay, perfect. I just wanted to make sure to get clarification on that. Thank you. Yeah, so the DRC. You for, yeah, the DRC though doesn't take public comment. Um, okay. So, but with within the planning commission, I'm assuming. Planning commission. Yeah, and then through that, uh, when we determine to hold kind of that concept level public involvement period. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And that's pretty much my questions were in regards to this process. So, and you went over quite a bit. So thank you. I appreciate that. I think we lost Dale. Are there any other questions? Are there any other questions? Not for me. All right, I got kicked out for a second. I was panicking. Uh, Project updates, Melinda. Okay, well, uh, one of the things that the RDA chair and vice chair asked uh, was for us to provide a kind of a written update with our projects. And I, we've had several meetings as of late where we've kind of had to skip the project update section. So um, I think that'll be a good practice going forward is to, uh, just have a brief written project update for you all that we'll include in the packet. So um, I'll just, I briefly gave you an update on the cell phone tower relocation. Finally, that's underway. We anticipate the construction will take between eight and 12 weeks, which puts us really kind of the end of March. So um, also I let you know that the 42 South uh, road construction final costs came in and uh, the Public Works Department did a really great job of keeping the budget down with that project. So we have, they sh should maybe have already received their check, but we've reimbursed the developer the remainder of their 2017 TIF payment, which was just over $75,000. So hopefully that'll help them construct that parking lot that they have approved over there and uh, get some more relief for the parking issues over there. That parking lot should bring about 50 more parking spaces to the area. Um, uh, we hopefully, we did receive the dates on the 48th South, South State Street exclusive negotiation agreement from Eadland last week. Uh, we just need to sit down and go over those with uh, with GL and with the mayor's office. And um, once we have those finalized, we'll be sending that back to Evelyn for uh, signatures. And then when that's executed, we'll send out an agreement, the final agreement to the board. So you can see that. Um, Jesse Knight Legacy Center, they're still continuing to work with the state DEQ to refine exactly what they need to do with the cleanup process for that site. Um, think architecture, we also uh, have completed a phase one and two on that property through the Brownfields grant. They'll start working on a cost assessment 
soon. And based on what that comes back at, um, we'll determine next steps with Think Architecture. But working through the Brownfields grant um, is great because those assessments are paid for uh, by the federal dollars and not out of pocket by the city or by the developer, but it does take a lot longer to work through that process. So um, we had anticipated some of those answers we would get back last summer, but um, here we are in January still waiting for some of those processes to be complete. So, but that's still uh, very much on our radar and Hopefully, we'll get answers uh, back on that in March and then be bringing forward some final steps with that development to you um, early summer. And then also, we received uh, initial disbursement of our 2020 tax year payments from the county in December. And so we'll um, be working with Brenda and with uh, Zion to get the final payment amounts determined and start working to process the TIF payments that we'll need to make for the fire clay area. And um, that is it, unless there's any questions. Anybody have any questions for Melinda? It doesn't look like it. We'll adjourn the meeting and Thank you. Are we starting on time, Diane, for meeting at all? Yeah, 5.15, so we'll have to go out of this meeting and then go into the, to the other. So okay. That's right, so we're signing out of here then. Yeah, we're yeah. signing out, and then, then we'll sign into the other one. So, so you've got about nine minutes. Okay. See you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, man. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Thanks.